And so we're going to start with Jim. Um, it was in and out. There you are. Jim, can you walk us through the section or the draft language of what the recommendations the House sent to us? Sure. Would you prefer to start with the bill language or the the letter, letter you received? From the uh, does the bill language reflect the letter? It does. Then let's do the bill language. Okay. So let me pull this up. Uh, if I could share the screen. There it is. Uh, it's right here. Why is it over there? Okay. Committee, I have to make you go away, so holler if you want to speak. Okay. Can you see that's this? That's great. Yep. That's a bit good. too big. Let me get this. Okay. This is so. only a 35 page bill. <laughs> uh, so, for the record, uh, Jim Damore, Les Consul, we're going uh, through draft 3.12. I'm not sure it's what one, two, but 3.12 of this draft uh, committee bill. Um, I'll take you through the changes, but I'll start with the EOL pieces. Um, so I'll come back to, to the beginning to go through the rest. Um, so the first recommendation that came from Senate Education was to add a, a weight for EOL, ELL students. So in the weighting section, which is coming up, uh, you'll see that there's language now, the first step is for, for the secretary to identify students who are EOL uh, learners. Uh, and then the second step is, is to apply the weight. And that Excuse me, Jim, yeah. the, the, the page is not moving as you're speaking. Oh, I had that problem before. Let me stop sharing and refresh. I'm not sure what's going on. Uh, Okay, and I am going to try and print this out so I can. So it's back up. Do you see it moving now? Yes. Uh, yes. Yeah, now Good. it's uh, moving. Okay, I'm sorry. So we are on page 10 uh, of the bill, and we're adding a weight for EOL students, and the language is here. Uh, it says the secretary shall next apply a weight for EOL pupils. Each EOL pupil included in long-term membership uh, shall receive an additional weight weighting amount of 2.49. That's the weight part. Okay. And then there's a grant part too. So coming up to new section here it is okay so you have a new section um being added in section 7 to title 16 uh 4013 um first it defines uh eol students who are english language learners for whom english is not their primary language uh, and then it defines eol services means instructional and support personnel and services that are required under the Equal Education Opportunities Act uh, for EOL students and their families, which shall include uh, licensed teachers, paraprofessionals, translators, and cultural liaisons, high quality instructional materials such as books and digital resources, family support and education, with assistance from cultural liaisons who speak the student's native language and community outreach, education, and engagement. Um, and then section B is, is what's required to be offered. So it says each school district shall provide ELL services as just defined, uh, budget sufficient resources through a combination of state and federal categorical aid and local education spending to provide EL, ELL services, report expenditures on ELL services annually to the agency of education through the financial reporting system as required by the agency, and report on educational outcomes of ELL students as required by the agency. 
Uh, the next subsection is around the agency support and quality assurance. So it says the agency of education shall provide gui guidance and program support to all school districts with EOL students as required under federal law, including professional development for instructors and support personnel, information on best practices and uh, WIDA language and development standards, and prescribe, collect, and analyze financial and student outcome data from school districts to ensure that districts are provide high quality ELL services and expending sufficient resources to prov provide these services. And then D goes into categorical aid. So it says in addition to the ELL weight uh, under section 410, which we just went through, a school district that has as determined annually on October 1 of the year, one to five EOL students enrolled shall receive state aid of 25,000 for that school year, or six to 25 EOL students enrolled shall receive state aid of $50,000 for that school year. And then E is the appropriation section. It says annually the General Assembly shall include in its appropriation for statewide education spending um, and appropriations provide um, aid to school districts for EO services under this section. And then next is the payment section. So on um, before November 1 of each year, the state treasurer shall withdraw from the education fund based on warrant of the commissioner of finance and management and shall forward to each school district the aid amount owed under this section. So that incorporates the recommendation of, um, of uh, Senate, Senate education. Okay, committee questions. Uh, Madam Chair, I have a question. Yeah, okay, maybe you can take, well, let's hear the question then we'll decide if we can take it down. Yeah, um, I'm just, I think I know the answer, but, and, and so now it's an embarrassing question because this is a significant change, but <clears throat> the, um, when we're describing the weights, Jim, there's first apply grade level weights, next apply weights for people from economically disadvantaged. Is there any impact, maybe this is a Brad James question, but is there any impact of the order of those uh, determinations? I don't believe so. I think the grade weights might need to go first, but everything else, I think, could be in, in any or, order. Um, I, I, when I was drafting, I didn't have in mind that the order made made. I did not have in mind that the order made a difference. That's kind of what I was hoping. Okay, thanks. We can double check that with Brad, Madam Chair. Yes. Do you know Senator Hardy? Yeah. So it um, used to matter because some of the weights were multiplicative and some of them were additive. Uh, right. the, the grade and the poverty weights were multiplicative. So you, they um, did the multiplication first and then added on top of that. Um, so now that they're all additive, it doesn't matter um, as much. Um, but I think that traditionally the grade weights have been applied first because those used to be multiplicative. Um, and those are the ones that more or less every single district has um, because mo almost every district has middle and high school. There are some just elementary districts, but. Okay. Thank you. Okay. So maybe committee, that was the big, the big square box we've been waiting for. Is that what the committee would like? Is that okay? I I was hoping we could just stick it in. Yeah, the um, in yesterday's draft, there was, or, or the last draft we were looking at, I think, I'm trying to find it here, where we talk about the need to have sort of an ongoing look at the weights. Yeah, that's, our, that's the advisory board. We'll, we'll get to that. Okay, good. Okay. Thank you. 
I'm waiting for all my last of my 35 pages to print out so I can start marking it up. Oh, that's your printer. I thought it was a train going by. No, that's my yard printer, or something. And I think it's almost done. <laughs> I hope. Okay, Jim, maybe we can go back. I'm not going to have to put paper in again. Um, to one. And we can start just walking through and see where we're in agreement. Perfect timing. I now have my copy so I can mark it up. No, I don't. I have five more pages to go. I'm out of paper. Give me a minute. Okay, let's start walking through. And if I'm lucky, I won't have anything to mark on the first page. Okay, <laughs> we're on page one. Um, page one, just uh, in the statement of um, Wait, purpose Jim? of the bill. Yes. I'm sorry, Julia had her hand up. So I, I just wanted to give, oh, I don't know if you want to see just... people. I can see people because I moved you all. Oh, over. let me see if I can. I shut most people out. Well, I don't see Julia. Water. Um, but Julia, if you've got your hand up, you have a... Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Julia Richter with Joint Fiscal Office for the record. I just wanted to follow up to Senator Pearson's question as well as Senator Hardy's response and just also add in that the way my understanding of the draft that I have in front of me, there's also the... Um, the sparsity and school, um, small school weights. So while it doesn't necessarily matter um, mathematically, as Senator Hardy mentioned, when the weights are applied, that's sort of an if then situation. So first you look to see if the, if the school is sparsely, um, it's first the sparsity weight and then the small school weight applied, if that makes sense. Yes. Okay. So let's, we're on page one here. Let's go down. What do we, this is under age six. So we added to support school food programs. So there are still ah. six, 16 positions in this draft, but they've been rearranged a bit. So you'll see later on when we get to the, the, the section, but now you have one person to support uh, school food programs and the development of the universal income declaration form. You have three people to provide financial, <laughs> financial and day support to the agency and the education fund advisory com committee. Uh, and you have, uh, as before, uh, two uh, staff to support EIL services. Okay. okay. Uh, so, so that I'm going to focus on the change sections. Is that what you're well, you want we to walk through the entire through bill? The whole bill. So I think we really need to kind of walk through the bill and just, you know, we can do the 2000 foot kind of view just to make sure that everybody is comfortable with what's in there, so. Okay. Um, do, do you want me to review findings in detail or do you want to just to have those as? Uh, all right. Oh dear, this is redoing it. So. We'll just let it go. Um, so just committee, read through the findings. See if there's anything there. Brigham State. All right. This kind of background, of course, uh, how we yeah. got here. So it's talking about our um, constitutional requirement to provide substantial equality of educational opportunity in Vermont. Um, and um, uh, Text about the importance of this in the changing economy, 
Um, and then uh, C talks about no. students come to school with different learning needs that have to be addressed. Um, and then going to the history of some of the background acts, so 173, um, and then um, going into the report that came out of that from Tammy Colby, saying that the weights were outdated. Um, and then at 59 from last session, that created the task force uh, and their report. So that's probably the findings. Uh, the goals are here, there are five goals. Uh, the big goal uh, is to fulfill Vermont's constitutional mandate to ensure that all students receive substantial equality of educational opportunity throughout the state. And that specifically is designed to increase educational equity. I won't read all this, but um, improve educational outcomes, improve transparency, um, and enhance educational and financial accountability, and improve oversight of uh, the K through 12 system. So those are the five goals broadly. Then we go into um, changes uh, in the determination of weighted membership. So first we're, we're, we're making some changes to the definition of long-term membership. So just to remind the committee the way you come up with, with equalized peoples is you start with your average daily membership, which is just an enrollment count for the current year. And you average that with a prior year enrollment count and you come up with what's called long-term membership. So it's really just an average of two years enrollment count. Mm -hmm. uh, and then you weight that and then you um, apply the equalization ratio and you come up with the equalized pupils. So this is the um, second step. So after ADM, then you do long-term membership and it's um, creating uh, an, an exception. Usually it's just the two-year average of ADM, but there's a, a small wrinkle that Brad uses to do the two-year average of small school, grant, small school weights. Um, he uses the past two years as opposed to the current year in the past year. So there's a slight language change there to account for that methodology. Um, and then section four changes, but what is the poverty ratio, which is no longer relevant, uh, changes that to a definition of pupil from an economically deprived background I'm on line nine. Mm -hmm. uh, and that is a pupil who uh, is eligible for free or reduced price lunch under the uh, federal laws. Okay. Um, so that's there. Uh, and then we have the universal income declaration form. Um, and this states the intention uh, of the General Assembly uh, that the determination of whether a student is from an economic, economically sorry, deprived background uh, be changed from um, eligibility for free or reduced price school meals uh, to a measurement determined by General Assembly, uh, not lower than 185% of current year po federal poverty level. And importantly, with data collected from a universal income declaration form. Um, mentions that the form is used by other states. Uh, it um, reduces stigma. Um, and the agency is the convening and working group on before October 1, 2022 including some stakeholders to develop the new form to be uh, ready for the 23-24 school year. Okay, so this, when you first started reading in, about other states, I thought this was a standardized form, but this is a form that the Agency of Education will put together sp specifically for Vermont it will be sent to schools and schools will send it home with children or mail it, or it's up to them. I don't think I know the details yet of how it will be distributed. Okay. Um, but before any of that happens, the General Assembly has to set on the top of section five, 
for eligibility meals measure, measurement determined by the general assembly so we will have to do that next year based on what and hmm. how will that get submitted to the general assembly should we say the a, the Committee on Education shall. So, <clears throat> Madam Chair, if I may. Mm -hmm. yes. So um, this this was just language that is establishing intent, I believe. Um, so the the measurement that um, is used in the form would be the same as the measurement that's used for free and reduced lunch, um, which is 185% of the federal poverty level. Um, but if it's confusing, we can certainly take that out. Well, it um, says but, meals to a measurement determined by the General Assembly. Yeah, and I think that the, the intent there is that it could be a different, we could set it at 200% of the poverty level, for example, but this would be saying it couldn't be lower than 185% um, because okay, that's well, a free and reduced lunch. It probably would be good to set a number. I just don't want us getting back and having the school send out all these forms and waiting for Bill to make it through the entire legislative process, you know, saying 185 or 200. Mm -hmm. um, so it, if we just say in this bill, it shall be, then the General Assembly will have voted. And when the schools start moving, they'll know what they're moving with. Does that, do we wanna stick with the 185 to start with or up it committee? Madam Chair. Yes. Um. I, I guess that this section caught my eye in a similar but slightly different reason. Um, Senate Ag had a lot of testimony when we were working on universal meals about the need for this form and AOE and, and uh, Hunger Free Vermont. It was broadly agreed mm -hmm. this is the right way to go. So what I see here is, is a direction to get people who can figure out the details together and do that and an expression of intention and and one of the questions is that that I, I suppose it's implied is they would figure out if it's 185 or 187 or 200 or whatever the percent of poverty but i i guess i would hope that we would make it more explicit that we will shift once that work is done we will shift and and jim that's not expressed here that i see um and baked into that would be us deciding or letting the working group figure out 185 but um am i right that there's not an actual replacement it's a, an expression of intent and setting up the scheme to replace it but not automatic well the end here talks about a shell giving the working group uh, um, uh, for implementation for the 23-24 school year. That's more directive. Um, well, then what if we what if we in section four say, you know, until if we phase that out, once this form is available, that 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 would make sense to me. It doesn't answer the chair's question about 185. But but it at least makes it uh, uh, in concert with those two sections. Well, the form can go out. We just can't calculate the data in the form until we set the rate, right? So, and, uh, but I would feel more comfortable if rather than just say, well, there's all these interested people out there and they're working on setting the rate, some committee in the legislature, and it would probably be the Committee on Education in 
discussion with all interested parties uh, would recommend a number or so, because this just, it doesn't say who's, who is responsible for coming right. back to the General Assembly and saying this is what the rate should be. If, if I may, that I think that for um, logistical and mathematical purposes, um, frankly, um, we need to start with 185% um, yes. because that's how the weights have been calculated right now. If we change it to even 187% or 190% or 200%, we would have to recalculate the weights and that okay. would set that set everything back again. No. Um, so my recommendation um, is, is I think what Senator Pearson was saying about tying section five um, and using that income form back to section uh, section four, the 4001 paragraph eight, Jim, and that that sec the part at the end, uh, line 17 through eight through 19, where it says to use the school lunch, saying once the income form is developed, we would be using that instead of the school lunch. So that would tie that no bow. And then the second thing would be um, instead of having this language that says as determined by the um, General Assembly, just get rid of that and just say free and reduced meals. Um, a measurement not lower than 185% of the current year federal poverty level, which would um, would stay, keep the weights consistent. Then if we want to consider in the future changing that, we could add that to one of the things that is recommended when the rates, when the weights are recalibrated or recalculated so that okay. it could be part of that process. But um, what it says is not lower than. Does that mean some schools might calculate it? What I'm trying to see is who are we assigning the responsibility to set that rate? We would just set it here and saying not lower than 185%. But not lower it, than doesn't set it. It gives a range. Right. Okay. It, You're it, fair. It, and we would just say... Um, that the, the income form, I guess we just say 185% at this point, and then give the, um, put in the calculate recalculation of the weights, the ability to change it in the future if it's necessary. Yes. Okay. That works. Yeah, so I, I agree. On a, on a level playing field. So in here, we're just going to say, uh, take out as determined by the General Assembly. And just say it's 185%. The General Assembly can always change it. Um, and that that may, all the weights, yeah, everything is equal in that. Okay. Okay, so it's just eligible for free and reduced meals. Yeah, we've got to reword that. It's re free and reduced meals. If we do the universal income declaration, is that how we're calculating free and reduced meals? Yes, and that's one of the nice things about this form is it could be used for both purposes. Okay, but I think we need to make that clear that we're going to start out with the present calculations once those universal, and we're not going to get all of them. So we say a majority of the free and reduced lunch. I mean, I think to me that the, the, the form, the mandate here is not that every single person bring it back, but presumably the working group would also be engaged in how to get a successful return rate. Wait, have we got a working group? Well, it's AOE plus interested whoever's, right? Um, yes, it's a working group, um, including school staff and hunger and nutrition experts. 
Okay. You had the, the. Okay. Jim, do we give you enough to clean yep. that up? I think you did. Yep. Okay. All right. All right. Let's keep moving. Okay. So we are now in section six, uh, and this is the big part here where we're changing the weights. Um, so this is the amendment to 4010, um, Prevention of Weighted Membership. And it's a step-by-step -step process. It's kind of like a recipe. Uh, so uh, the first step is um, uh, on before the first day of December during each school year, the secretary shall determine the average daily membership um, and again, that's just a, a student enrollment count um, uh, of each school district for the current year. These determinations are list separately. Uh, resident pupils in pre-K, resident pupils in K through grade five, resident pupils in grade six through eight, and resident pupils in, in grade nine through 12. Uh, and then again, by the same same timing, the secretary will identify resident pupils from economically deprived backgrounds. And then uh, next uh, same day, the secretary will identify EOL students. Okay, when he's determining four hundred one eight, that's using that either free or reduced lunch or the universal income declaration, right? Correct. Yeah. However, that okay. that will be. Yeah. Correct. Okay. Yeah. Uh, and then four is um, li listing out school districts that have low population densities, um, measured by the number of persons per square mile, and uh, and that's broken out by districts that have fewer than thirty six persons per square mile, and districts that have thirty six to fifty four and districts that have 55 to 100. And that data will be uh, based on the most recent US census data as provided by the Vermont Center for Geographic Information. And then uh, the secretary uh, by the same date needs to uh, list school districts that have one more schools that have small school enrollment. So average two year enrollment of fewer than 100 enrolled pupils uh, or uh, 100 to 250 enrolled pupils. And that's by school and not by district. Um, and then this has a, a little bit of a funky definition rather than using long-term enrollment, the two-year uh, ADM average. This uses a two-year average of the previous two years. Um, and this is how Brad does it. So it's a little bit of an exception to the count here, but with the same purpose. Um, so that was the, the second step. The third step, it, so the second step here is to determine long-term membership, which is simply taking uh, the, the average uh, current enrollment um, in these categories, uh, averaging with the previous year. So that will be happening in B. And then the third thing is to add the weights. So this says the secretary shall determine the weighted long-term membership for each school district. Uh, so one, the secretary shall first apply the grade level weights. So that is um, a negative 0.454 for pre-K. Uh, and then a positive 0.36 for grades six through eight and positive 0.39 for grades nine through 12. Then there's a weight for people from economically deprived backgrounds at 1.03. And then next there's a weight for ELL pupils, which is a weighting of 2.49. And then the weight for um, Low population uh, density school districts, it's uh, 0.15, where the number of persons per square mile is 35 or fewer. 0.12, where it's 35, 36 or more, but fewer than 56. And 0.07, where it's um, 
uh, 56 or more, but fewer than 101. And lastly, the search reply is to wait for small schools. So it's conditional. So if the number of persons per square mile uh, in a school district is, is 55 or fewer, uh, and the school district has um, average enrollment of fewer than 100 pupils, then we see an additional waiting amount of 0.0. Sorry, 0.21, and that's only for the students in the small school. Uh, and um, if they have 100 uh, or more, but fewer than 251 pupils, then they get additional weight of 0 0.07 for each pupil in the small school. And then six just says that the school district's weighted long-term membership shall equal long-term membership um, as the average of two years, uh, plus the accumulation of the weights assigned by the secretary. So the whole thing accumulates uh, under, under subdivision six. Then we've taken out text, which is the old text about how waiting is done. So those are struck out. The hold harmless, uh, which is a 3.5% decline, is still here, although later in the bill it is suspended for the transitional period. Um, and uh, it's the same. And then uh, we have language about updating updates to the weighing factors. And it says it is the intention of the General Assembly to consider whether and how to update the weighing factors under sub section C of this section. Um, it should say uh, not less than, that the is a mistake, not less than every five years. And if they are updated, the implementation date for the updated weights be delayed by a year in order to provide school districts with time to prepare their budgets. Updates to the weighing factors may include recalibration, recalculation, adding or eliminates, or any combination of these actions. Um, then we're amending the very same section we just amended, but at, at a future date. So this doesn't come in until 2028. And what it's doing is after the transition period, it is using a three-year average of the equalized people count um, rather than just the current year. Um, so it's smoothing out the count going forward. Um, and then we have um, this provision about perspective and conditional repeals. It says if on um, before July 1, uh, 2027, so five years out. The General Assembly has not revised the weighing factors to reflect changes in cost factors from uh, from which weights are derived after receiving a recommendation of the Education Fund Advisory Committee, committee to, do, to do so, then um, you're repealing the weights altogether. Um, and you're repealing the, the, the Section 6A, which is the the one that talks about using a three-year equalized people average. So this is this is designed to force the legislature to take some action within five years, either update them or or repeal this provision here. Um, Can we talk about that, Madam Chair? Yes. So uh, uh, maybe I'd ask Senator Hardy. Uh, um, I'm all for motivating the legislature uh, to get it's self into gear, uh, but but this does seem um, <laughs> seems fairly intense. Um, can you just? Mm -hmm. I, I mean, we we set it up for. Uh, talk to me about about the 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 logic, if you could. Um, sure, and I uh, Jim and I talked about this quite a bit to try to figure out how to create a mechanism that sort of forces the legislature to, to take action because we can't bind a future legislature. Um, but one of the reasons that we sort of got into this situation where the weights were really out of date is because we didn't do anything with them for a long time, except for one weight, to be fair to Brad James, we did change the grade level weight um, a few times um, at his recommendation, but the other ones we didn't. and. Um, so this would, uh, the, the, the report authors recommended that the weights be recalculated or recalibrated every five years. And so this would force the first recalibration because they were done um, 
uh, in 20, essentially we're putting them into place now. So this would be in five years. So it would force them to either recalculate them or recalibrate them or get rid of this um, sunset um, saying, oh, we don't need to do it. Um, and it would for force the legislature to listen to the advice of this new education fund advisory commission, which is supposed to recommend the recalibration or recalculation of the weights. So that's why it's in there. I mean, obviously you can always repeal or repeal um, and just ignore it. And that's the other possibility. Um, we couldn't figure out another way to sort of force the action of the legislature. There's the intent language, but that doesn't quite do it, so. And, and what about the, the, the phase in, any concern that that, I, I mean, I guess this does seem a little extreme to me because they can just, if they want to ignore it, it's, it's pretty easy. There are baked in interests who will make it harder to ignore because we're setting up the evaluation. So I, I, to me, this is not, you know, in some ways it's no big deal one way or another, but it's not um, as iron uh, Loctite as we would think. But um, the five-year thing, I, I guess, would had you considered starting this in 10 years, start, starting to have, fine, you know, because we've got a phase in, then we're quickly getting a reevaluation when, and it's actually just two years, right? Yeah, well, one of the problems is that the weights originally were calculated based on data from 2010 to 20, 2018, I think. And so they already actually are out of date. And we recalculated them last fall, but that's a sort of more minor process than a full recalibration. And so we're already kind of in the place where we should be re fully redoing them. And okay. um, so, you know, I, I think it's sort of, if we wait even longer, it's gonna, they're gonna get older and older um, is sort of my feeling. I, I, I and we will have, there is new data, things have changed already since the, the weights were created to begin with. And so if we don't have a mechanism to recalibrate -cal them, it's, they're gonna get out of, they're already, they already will be out of date. All right, thank you. We do a, a similar thing, I believe with, used to be the tax, property tax rate. The yield, I'm looking at Senator McDonald, but I believe if the legislature fails to set a yield, and I, I it, we, when it was the tax rate, if we didn't set the tax rate, it reverted to the original dollar ten. Is am I correct in that, Senator McDonald? You are correct about that. I couldn't answer the same question with the yield. But it, if we don't act, it goes back to what the original yield was, and we've never we've never gotten to a state tax rate of a dollar ten. So it automatically up the taxes if we fail to act. Yeah, and I think there's some you provision. May, you may be, be very well be correct. I I cannot vouch for it. I'm, yeah. um, that's my. That, that's on me, not on you. No, I, she's. there is a provision related to the yield that I think if we don't change the yield every year, it goes back to the 2010 yield, I believe, or something like that. Yeah. So it's a similar provision about the yield uh, that, that's a really dramatic thing that happens if we don't act. Um, so there's precedent for this, even though it seems extreme. It's making us take a painful decision, which may or may not, negatively impact some of our constituents and it right and there the reason that that we left in the three-year rolling average for the equalized pupil count um right now we don't have a three-year rolling average we left in the three-year rolling average so when there is recalculations or recalibrations they automatically phase in without having to go back to zero and and re-phase them in um, because the the, the three-year average sort of levels out the phase-in of new weights. Um, 
this is a five-year roll-in because the change is so drastic. Hopefully changes in the future won't be as drastic and the three-year roll-in will be sufficient. Well, if, if the population changes, it, it could be. Yeah, sure, yeah, and then shift. yeah, could change it again in the future, but. Okay. So we're on section 6B, am I right, Jim? Yep. And that sets dates. Okay, what are we repealing? Uh, you're repealing uh, the whole waiting system. Oh, that's the section where we repeal it. All right. Yep. Okay, then we're into section seven. Yep, which we've gone, gone through. Um, that's the EOL uh, provision that we went through earlier. Do you want to touch on that again, or, or should we? Keep I going? think we can remember that long. Okay. Uh, okay. Okay, now we're into um, a different topic, which is the merger support. Um, so this gets rid of the small school grants and uh, keeps in though um, the merger support grants for di districts, districts that either voluntarily or were involuntarily merged. And that language is down here. So if you're voluntarily formed, you get your merger support grant. Um, if you are involuntarily formed, you get a merger support grant and they go away um, really only if the small school closes. Um, so, but they don't get the grant if they get the weight. So it's either the grant or the weight, not both. Okay, so they get the grant or the weight. Correct. Yep. All right. Um, then we have just... Um, you know, I'm sorry, and I'm not objecting to that, but I thought we were described, it, it had been described that everyone gets the grant that you get, that the smaller, the schools of smaller population get the grant and the weight. Am I, am I just misremembering that or have we changed? You're confusing think, the ELL stuff with the merger support. So this is oh, about, oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. This is about districts that have merged under Act 46. So they can't get the ELL, or sorry, now I'm doing it. They can't get the merger support grant and the small schools weight. If they qualify for the small schools weight, they don't get the grant and they get the grant only if they merged. I okay. had eggs for lunch and I still have some on my face. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So section nine is merely a conforming change to get rid of the reference to small school support. Um, section 10 is again a conform conforming change to uh, get rid of small school support. Um, section 11 is transition. So first is um, A is around the, um, the three fiscal years, the first three fiscal years of imp implementation, the um, equalized pupils will be a five year average. Um, and then in, in the fourth year, it will be a three, uh, four year average. And then in the last year will be a three year average. And then that will continue thereafter as well, a uh, three year average. So this is, we saw that laid out in a grant the other, in a draft, yeah, a graph the other day. Okay. And this is our transition plan. Okay, have, and this is where we thought it might cost money. So is Julia still with us? I can't see people. Julia, are you still here? Don't hear her. So we'll have to get a fiscal note on this. Uh, just to see if it is. 
So this are you is talking about the the role the phase in of the yeah the this transition plan is where we thought we might actually because the idea is the more we give the less they raise in taxes but depending on how we transitioned it we just wanted to make sure you know we we just would need a fiscal notice to what kind of impact that could have on the um, grand list or the ed fund. Right, it wouldn't happen until the following fiscal year. So none of this right. would- but Just, a, fiscal just a fiscal year. note, just to be sure. Okay. Okay, Jim, I think we can go unless there's other questions. Okay. So section 12 uh, deals with transition uh, as well. So this is suspending the excess spending penalty for the, the transitional years, the five years, and also suspending the hold harmless provision, the 3.5% hold harmless for that same five year period. Okay, and did we get any fiscal notes on any of this? this Madam party, Chair, I think this is, is the excited part. about the excess spending threshold as the other body. Um, so I'll ask Joint Fiscal to take a look at it. Hi, Madam Chair. Uh, um, you're there. Okay. I'm sorry. I, I I briefly had a had a phone call. I had to attend That's to, fine. but. Um, with regards to a fiscal note, we have not prepared a fiscal note yeah. at this point um, because the bill is is still being ironed out. But we are following it closely, and I'm 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 working on some analysis and happy to provide analysis. Uh, that for the would committee. be good. I, we're looking at section eleven and twelve, which is the transition rolling average, and the uh, I don't know if suspension of the hold harmless because that depends on who votes what um, the excess spending but any thoughts you can give us or predictions on that would be helpful yeah yeah I'm happy to look into that um, I guess the, the the challenge the challenge that that um, that we're having at the moment in terms of the modeling is just all of these moving pieces and right. um, all of the all of the details and all of the considerations um, and the the data that we're working with, but to the extent that we can prepare a fiscal note, I'm of course more than happy to do so, and also happy to um, come in and, and talk to the committee um, about what some of these transition costs may look like. Although there are a number of assumptions that we're working with, so it's. I think yeah, I think all we understand we've got a hundred moving parts <laughs> and it's going to come down to what the people at the local level vote eventually. But just any red flags that you see something that could have, you know, major impacts on the ed fund, mm -hmm. that kind of thing. Yeah, definitely. I'm happy to do that. Um, and we'll get back to you as soon as I can. Okay, that's good. But it has to be by the end of you got two weeks yes this has to be out by crossover yeah that but deadline is on our stop timeline in the other body so anything that well, you know, it, we miss um it, it will also go from here to approach so they're obviously um they will look at it want to be interested in fiscal yeah mm -hmm. oh okay. this will go to approach yeah, there's positions in here. There's there's okay. Yeah, then we've meeting. got to get this out of here ASAP. Today, Madam Chair. If we could, it would be good. All right, let's keep going. Maybe we can do that. I haven't got any red flags on my paper yet. Okay, so, so section section thirteen. Sorry, 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 sorry. Yeah. Okay, um, so section thirteen um, is requirement for the Vermont Center for Geographic Information to assist a AOE in determining the number of, of persons per square mile. Um, and then we come to evaluation and reporting. So um, 
I'll read through this, describe it here. So it says on before uh, December 15, 2029, the state auditor shall submit to the House to various committees, including you, uh, a performance audit conducted under generally accepted government auditing standards that identifies the successes and failures of the implementation of this act, including whether and the extent to which each of the act's five goals under section two of this act have been met. If a goal has not been met, the reasons why and recommendations to achieve that goal and the fiscal impact of the act, including the cost of implementation. And then it says, on or before December 15, 2024, the auditor, AOE, and the new committee uh, uh, shall jointly agree to the statement of work for the audit, including how to measure whether the Acts 5 goals have been met, and submit the statement of work to, uh, to you um, so you have a chance to review it. Um, and then it goes on to say that the audit should be carried out by the state auditor or a contracted designee, but has to be someone who would be independent. Um, and then it says that the audit will shall cover the period beginning on July 1, 2024 and ending on June 30, 2028. So that's the entire five-year implementation period. And therefore, after that's over, they have a year and a half to do their audit work. Um, and says so the audit shall take into account such metrics as the auditor, the agency, and the committee jointly determine appropriate, which shall include a number of things that Rep. Hardy went through um, earlier. So I won't repeat this all, but a number of metrics here are listed. Um, and then we move on to a different topic, which is the new committee. So should I pause here? Okay, committee. Thoughts on this section? It's okay? Um, I, I definitely have a question. I well, do. but I'm, okay. I'm glad to see Sarah Brock because my question is for him. So I'll let him go first. Okay. Okay. Senator well, Brock, you have joined us. I can't see you. Yeah. Well, the, the, the issue in, 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 in all of this is uh, we're doing all kinds of stuff and we're spending all kinds of money and we're making all kinds of changes. And the real question is, is what we're doing working? And um, I, I am concerned <clears throat> about how long this is going to take, but you know, realistically, the auditor can't audit something that hasn't been done. And so you have to have something done uh, and you have to have an agreement as to uh, b between the parties as to, as to what, uh, what is done and what is it that ought to be measured. Uh, and I guess I'm satisfied uh, in the arrangement that uh, of, of the parties that are involved in this, uh, particularly where it's done out in the open. And so uh, any of us who have disagreements about the methodology will We'll certainly have a chance to speak up. One of the things though that might be useful as we look at the various things that are gonna be reported on uh, in, in terms of, uh, uh, and, and they're listed here in, in the bill, it would be great if those things, uh, if it were clear that those things would be available uh, uh, to the public within a reasonable period of time after being calculated on an ongoing basis. That way, those of us who are armchair auditors can be looking at what's happening as it's happening and raise red flags before 2031 or whenever it is that the final report will be done. And that's what I would recommend that we add something that these particular items will also be publicly released on an annual basis or uh, as reasonable or as, 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 re as, re as quickly as possible after uh, their collection and completion. Um, okay, I'm looking at the list. I... Senator Hardy, did this come up? Do you know? I yeah. So I most um, of these are reported. Yeah. So the things that that are on this list, all of them are um, publicly reported right now um, and measured. Um, there, most of them are available on the, Depart the Agency of Education's website. 
um, except for obviously the academic extracurricular and support services across school districts, that would be some data that would have to be collected. And I mean, that's available on in, at an individual district level. I'm not sure that's collected on a statewide level at this point, but everything else is, I believe, and um, is available either from the agency of education. Um, some of them are, are the TOEFL exam, I believe is a federal exam, but the agency of education has those scores. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, the youth risk behavior survey is on the department of health's website and is publicly av available. Um, so all of these things already are available. And that's one of the reasons I chose them is because yeah. they're not new measures. Mm -hmm. Could we add or any other, the me this is being set up by a committee, right? An auditing. The, the measure, the specific metrics would be recommended by those three parties. Yeah, yeah I'm trying, I've thought, or the any other the measure they the thought might be valuable. Mm -hmm. Yes, I think we could add that if it's not already in. Is it in there already, Jim, or? Uh I couldn't hear the question. I'm sorry. There are a number of people speaking. Could we add or any other measure the parties think would be relevant? Yes, that's not? here now. So on page 26, let me go back there. Ah, so, okay, I'm on 27. All right. So 18 through 20, the auditor is taking into account such, such measures, measures as the auditor, AOE, and can be jointly determined okay. appropriate, which shall include. Okay. Well, we could, how about include, but not limited to? That's I want to make sure that if they go through that and say, you know, and start talking to school boards and say, well, I'm concerned about the kid that, and we've got more than a few that need so much help that we have succeeded if we keep that kid in school. We have succeeded. Maybe that'll show up in standardized tests, but um, I just want to give some flexibility in there for these. I suppose they have it, but. Um, when, when, from a drafting standpoint, the way we draft at least, include always means um, it's not exclusive. You can always do more. Okay. Um, it does so. mean, but not limited to. Yeah. Yeah. It does. Okay. Yeah. Okay, that's good then. Well, the question that I, I raised, Madam Chair, was whether or not we should explicitly state that the metrics that are going to be used for this evaluation uh, by the auditor over time, as they are available on an annual basis, shall be made available to the public. In other words, so that somebody who is following this can actually look and see yeah. what's happening in each of these areas. If the material is, is uh, is in fact being collected now, that shouldn't be a burden. Yeah, it is being collected. Uh, that's but, why but the you committee go find, chose You go try them. to find it. So who would be we charge with public? I would say that the agency of education would be the responsible party for ensuring that that gets done. Could we say that the education agency of education shall post? It's already posted on their website. They have a website with data. Um, you can go and get all of this on the website. Um, so I, I, I mean, we can certainly say it, but I, th I think it's already okay. there. I, I mean, I went and looked at all of this when I was coming up with this list to make sure that it was already collected because I didn't want to over. Um, I didn't want to overburden the agency. I didn't want to. Oh, that, that's my point. If it's no burden, it shouldn't be a problem to say so. But we can if, certainly if say you it, don't Senator say so, Brock. Then it's already on the website. Today, it may not be there tomorrow or the year after or the year okay. after that. So I think it's easy enough to say that the Agency of Education shall publish the standards on their website. Shall, yeah, shall publish annually. this list annually on their website. Um. Is it published annually? I, I I feel like the risk assessment one might be every other year. Yeah, the the youth risk behavior survey is a Department of Health um, thing, yeah. and it's every other year. And also, it also takes them once they do the survey, it takes a year to get the data out there. So 
you know, there's a lag because of getting data sorted through and cleaned and all that. So I, I think just report shall report it on their website, which would prevent them or yeah. Shall report updated versions on their website. Uh, as regularly as, reported. Yes. There there you go. Go. That's fine. That's fine. Okay. So, so we're through page 27. Well, sorry, oh, sorry, Madam Chair. But we're not my, through 27. We're, 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 we're real close. We're, um, I got to check my agenda and see. Oh, we got to get enough time left to do cannabis. So um, keep moving. I wouldn't want to interrupt people from doing cannabis. Um, no, I didn't think 20, so. 2020. <laughs> uh, so, so I guess I'm, um, we're, we're charging the auditor has to do this has to work with folks the the agency and the committee to do this and then um but is that then is there somewhere where it then happens again or is this just a one-time thing that is a really good question it is a one-time thing it is a one -time we, could thing. Make, we could make it at every five-year thing or something like that i think that would um, or, or recommend a, a, a regular audits after this. This is a pretty heavy lift, so maybe not this full thing every five years, but a smaller version. I, I wouldn't rec recommend making it a, a regular thing because this, this is a one-time thing because it's dealing with a new program and it's dealing with the analysis of something that's brand new. This may not be the same standard and, and detail that you would use to do to audit an ongoing program. And so I'd be I'd be a little bit hesitant to 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 just simply put it on an automatic repeat. Okay. But I think that we got plenty of time to deal with. We don't have to deal with that today. Okay. We may well change the weights. We've got year we've got years to do it. No, that's fine. Uh, um, and then the 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 audit is to be conducted under the standards uh i'm looking now for that language whatever you hear them all the time for yeah, generally accepted uh generally accepted and then, regarding standards gagas and and i guess i i don't think this is a big deal but i'd be curious what you think sarah brock um page 26 um we make it clear who the auditor may not contract with to do it. Now, I understand, I think we're sort of saying you can't go to the very people that we've depended on to design this new system and have them evaluate it. I'm sure they would say it's doing great. No, they wouldn't. They have integrity, but yeah. that's the risk. But I'm not aware of, I guess I, and it's not, it's almost not worth the question, but wouldn't the standards that were that the auditor applies to anything already preclude that or and and i'm just kind of curious it's it jumped out to me in theory it would yes it would you know it, it, realistically they they are likely going to go to uh an auditing firm a firm that is in the business of doing audits as opposed to uh the, the kinds of folks that we have in the design process uh of, of this program uh this is an auditor's job someone who knows what generally accepted government auditing standards are and produces a report accordingly uh, under those standards. So, this, and, this, you know, the, the issue of independent may be superfluous, but we wanted to make it clear that this is something that is, in fact, independent. And that's that was the only message there. OK. And but does this preclude whoever's doing the audit from talking to the very people that helped design it? Because that. No, no, not at all. Okay. Not at all. I right, kind of expect that they would. Yeah, I would hope so, too. Okay. Thank you, Madam Chair. Okay. Um, who's paying for the audit? Money yeah, changes well, is so much fun. <laughs> that, that's a good question. I mean, we could ask them to tell us how much it's going to cost because it doesn't happen for, for quite a few years. So okay. um, it, it doesn't happen until 2028. Um, so we certainly don't right. have to budget I mean, it. I, no. Just what I'm knowing about audits, it won't be cheap because no, this not. isn't just looking at the books. This is looking at student performance. This is looking at did we switch all this money around and the kids aren't doing any better than they did 10 years ago? Um, 
So it's... Well, until the three groups get together and define the scope of work and what the audit consists of, you can't estimate a cost now to, right. to but by any means. I just want to make sure, yeah. And I'd be very hesitant to say the funds would come out of the Ed Fund because by 2028, um, the Ed Fund may be in a very different position. So, okay. All right, we can keep going. Okay. <clears throat> um, you're under the advisory committee. Yeah, we're in the advisory com committee on page 28. Um, okay. So, section A creates the advis advisory committee. Um, and membership has not changed. So, Commissioner of Taxes or Inspector of Education or designee. And then uh, five members of the public appointed by different. Uh, parties or with different people, um, all with expertise in advancing. Do um, you really think we have that many people in Vermont with expertise in ed fund financing? I mean, what is expertise? And is Senator McDonald an expert in ed fund financing? Or it, it sounds good, but are we thinking of an accountant? Are we thinking of a school board member, what what was the task force? What kind of person was the task force thinking of? I think um, what we're we were hoping is is people that have had more ongoing um, ability to engage in education finance conversations than your average legislator who is trying to do 8 million bills at the same time or keep track of everything. Um, so it could be a school board member. Certainly there are school board members who are very well versed in education finance. It could be former legislators who have worked on education finance. It could be um, professors or um, uh, academics who do it, um, uh, accountants or, or people who have uh, financial expertise. Um, so I think it's a fair question about, you know, how many people have deep expertise in our particularly super complex system, but mm -hmm. there certainly are people who mm -hmm. have more expertise than, than the average uh, legislator in sort of looking deeply at the education fund. Um, okay. I guess it's in the eyes of the beholder or in the eyes of the appointer, I suppose, to define expertise as well. <laughs> yep. Okay. Well, when I was testifying as an expert witness, it was usually defined as someone from more than 50 miles away who has a dark suit. <laughs> well, this is Vermont. I guess we could find 50 people with dark suits. Uh, okay, let's, let's keep going. The membership. Madam Chair. Yes. Chair. You um, might be an expert, on, but I don't know if you have a dark suit, Senator. Um, if I had one, I probably wouldn't wear it. Um, <laughs> the, the, um, our, we, we have people, whether it's the school boards association, the superintendents association, um, perhaps the, the most uh, important um, recent development and expertise on this was the committee that was assembled and and has worked in the last several weeks, they have brought more legislators into being knowledgeable about stuff. Uh, those of us that were around 20 years ago have been gradually forgetting. Um, so I, I, I don't think we do a lot of good by creating a, simply a, num a number of uh, addition, another additional committee. Um, but the the the, ex, the the last this last group has created a uh, a freshman class that's going to go on to uh, of of knowledgeable people that's going to be doing us good for the next the next several years that's right. for sure. Nothing Thanks. precludes legislators being appointed. Thank you, Senator. Yeah. So we will see who's here to be appointed. All right, are we going? We're down to powers and duties. 
We are. Um, right. So the powers and duties are to make recommendations each year uh, by January 15 uh, to you regarding updating the weighting factors, which may include recalibration, recalculation, adding or limiting weights, or any combination of these actions as necessary. Uh, changes to um, or the addition of new or limiting, elimination of existing categorical aid as necessary, um, the property dollar equivalent yield, the income dollar equivalent yield, non-homestead property tax rate, excess spending threshold, uh, and the amount of the stabilization reserve. So those are annual recommendations. About two of them are as necessary, which are the... Okay. Uh, right? And then, but then it says, uh, in two, the committee shall recommend updated weights and categorical aid uh, at least every five years, which may include the recommendation not to make changes where appropriate. Okay, I guess my question is with the section above that, because they can recommend whatever they want, but the property debt value equivalent, the income dollar, those are all just arithmetical calculations, depending on the budgets. So, and that's, you know, we have to set the yield rate, but we can't set it wherever we want. It is set based on school spending, you know, reserves. Um, and I'm not sure that having a committee have to come together once a year, uh, to me, the, these are this is housekeeping stuff you know it, it's just saying this is what it is and so that's what the equivalent yield is this is what the schools are spending i would rather if if we're looking at them as having expertise maybe recommending any change in the new or eliminating existing yeah um that is good Categorical aid is not automatically set, but the other ones, perhaps any changes they might recommend um, to, to the way we calculate. Um, Senator McDonald. Um, Madam Chair, the, the system we have now has many parts that self-regulate, and that's one of the things that is, is repeated over and over again as being why it's lasted so long. Um, right now, I am reminded that one of the things that does, that does not self-regulate is the percentage of Vermonters who pay based on their household income on their local, on their local um, education taxes. And I have asked four or five times this year um, on what that we would we, we be told what the current percentage of Vermonters um, pay based on their household income. And we've heard numbers like from the 60s to um, the high 70s. And I, I think uh, Senator Hardy gave us a number last week, which uh, I think she refined and came back with yet an, uh, a more precise number. But we still don't have that number because that's the sort of thing that's difficult to calculate if, and we haven't calculated it and acted upon it in, uh, in over a decade or so. Um, so if this committee is trying to solve that sort of a problem, um, maybe it's useful, but it would seem to me that we should be able to ask for that number on any given year and have it given to us within days and we've been in this session now you know for the last well for the last two years and we haven't gotten that number from any anybody yet so well senator uh, that's a long I, I way of saying madam chair what's that number fine i think senator hardy gave you the number that was given to the the committee if you would like an a, a 
direct number. Have you directly sent an email to Joint Fiscal and asked for that number? I've, I've asked the committee repeatedly to ask for that number. I, Why don't you send the, an email over and ask for that number? But while we're doing this, you're right. I mean, the property equivalent, the income equivalent, that all gets set, but it gets set on a, you know, it's, it's a calculation unless I'm mistaken, but the, the, um, a better thing might be uh, we have adjusted the income level um, upwards. We have adjusted the home value. We have not adjusted the home values upward. Um, and this is all given the present taxing structure. But given the inflation in so we might want to put those recommendations in there, the home value, um, the income level, the any adjustments to those things, which do change over time. Um, and we could even ask for a recommendation in updating. I don't know what we call the super circuit breaker but it went from 35,000 to 47, where you get both state and local taxes capped. Um, and yes, and it was put in place in the, in the early 80s. Yeah. Yes. And it's been adjusted a couple of times. So Madam Chair, I'm gonna, I think Faith is listening and I'm, and I'm gonna ask her to um, ask JFO for that number on, on okay. behalf of the committee. Um, and maybe she sent that over this afternoon. But the point I was trying to make is if we, we as a finance committee need to take a look at that dollar figure, which doesn't change automatically, periodically, yes. um, and change it when we think it ought to be changed. And creating a committee to do that um, seems kind of cumbersome. Um, we are the ones that ought to be making those recommendations today after consulting with superintendents, school boards, or whatever. Okay, but so we this been is doing. asking them, I think it would be more helpful if we have a group of experts in ed finance that we're paying to come together. I don't know how often, I'll let a probe deal with that. Um, rather than ask them to talk about things that are presently just calculated there's no policy in there it's calculated Just to recommend to us any changes in the appropriate income levels to you know to get the same equity as it you know people are making more income and nine, we raised it to 90,000, right? And we've raised the home value and we've put a slope down. So I think those are things that would be helpful to get a recommendation as to when they should be upgraded or downgraded. And if the market crashes and everything goes down the tubes, um, we might need to downgrade all of that. So Senator Hardy, we just massacred your massacre. No, no, it's totally fine. So um, uh, the the C, D, and E, those three things, I think. Um, yeah, uh, those were. Um, so I I heard you loud and clear that and, and others about the December one letter. So we took that out. So this committee yeah. would no longer do the. It would stay the same as currently tax would do that. So I think those three things, C, D, and E are sort of leftovers from when the vision was that this group would do that December one letter. So I agree that those make sense to take out. And I like your suggestion about having this group do sort of bigger picture um, stuff. And the other thing I would sort of add to the list is our previous conversation on the poverty percentage um, that we, you know, remember the whole conversation we had earlier about 185 percent. Yes. Um, okay. And if we wanted to change that at any point, this they could make the recommendation. The income levels for the income tax 
um, portion. Um, I, I think this is this is good. And if you have a list, I can work with Jim to put it in there when we do another okay, draft. We'll get, I, I'm sure Julia can get us a list as to what the official terms are. Um, and and we can get those in. I hear the bells are ringing, which means our next set of witnesses on cannabis are showing up and we have not, I'm only through 29 pages. Um, what else have we got to go through here? I can take you through it quickly. Um, okay, let's go through this quickly. I'll be okay. quiet and we'll, I think we've been through the, the heavy lift stuff, but. I think we, yeah, I agree. So I did put in uh, the appropriation for here and therefore I had to put some number of meetings in per year up to. So uh, I put eight. Um, I'm not sure what the right number is, but some you years can it might be. just skip over that because appropriations. Okay. Is <laughs> okay, good. They're uh, going to deal with it. 16 is unchanged. It's a collaboration between AOE and JFO, uh, MO, MOU uh, on the uh, data models and other information needed to update weighing factors, hosting the models on, on the websites. Um, and um, I don't know if it says hosting the models, um, updating them as, as necessary, and then recommending uh, the um, recovery rates. Um, so that is unchanged. Um, staffing is changed. So again, we have six positions, two for EOL, one for school food programs, um, and to help develop and maintain the new Universal Household Income Declaration Forum, um, and um, three for financial and data analysis for AOE and the committee. Okay. Um, and then we've got only technical and conforming changes, and these are very technical. So um, just just taking out um, a few of the excess spending categories that aren't being used in numerous years. So one's about a merger of a school district with 20 fewer students. One is dual enrollment, which is not, not uh, funded um, through school different bu budgets anyway. Um, technical change here, just uh, equalized pupils, um, clarify what year it's for. Um, technical change on the school board, again, just uh, making the correct cross-reference. Um, and then the effective dates, which go on for a long time, but basically- We don't need to change those, huh? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. That's this it. This is one bill we have. All right. Committee, are we comfortable with this? We can get a final draft and vote it out when we get back and get it over with a little leeway for probes. Does this work? So we'll let Jim get a clean draft. Um, and we'll be ready to vote that out when we get back. All right. Get back meeting Tuesday or meeting today? Um, Tuesday, I think. That might be a little much to ask.